ready to go back to work. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I was remembering um, from what they used to do, the paper agenda. <laughs> Uh, yes, I saw him in the office. <laughs> All right, are we all ready to go, Scott? Really? Te Technology wise? Uh, yes. No. Oh. Great. Oh, there's the. Yeah, well, welcome everybody. Uh, we'll call this meeting of the Planning Commission to order. Uh, let me grab my agenda. It's Tim Murray. Oh, uh, yeah. Hold on. Let me wait until I give uh, Tim Murray a few more minutes. Has she reached out at all? Tim Murray is recusing herself um, because she has a contract with the Housing Matters Group. Oh, okay. So she will not be joining us this evening. Well, that's fine. It's not a vote or anything anyway, so we didn't even need a quorum or anything. Good. Do we? we? We debated about whether we, we quorum need a quorum to, to hold, a hold the meeting, um, which we have. Yes. So we're fine. <laughs> Sorry, let me be clear there. Yeah. Okay, so the meeting has begun without Commissioner Gordon. Are there any uh, statements of disqualification? I'll just note for Commissioner Gordon that. Um, she is recusing herself from this item because of a contract that she has with Housing Matters. Okay. Good. Anything else? All right. With that, we'll uh, turn to the staff for a presentation on the Coral Street plan. Are we going to do a roll call? Uh, I knew I was forgetting about something. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> Let's have a roll call. All right. Commissioner Dawson? Here. Commissioner Conway? Here. Commissioner Palmas? Here. Commissioner Maxwell? Here. Commissioner Kennedy? Here. And um, for the record, Commissioner Gordon and Commissioner Missity Miller are not present. All right, so with that, we'll turn to general business, the Coral Street Visioning Report. Oh, uh, just point of order, um, just statements of disqualification and oral communication. Um, I think we have to run through all of those. I don't know that we need oral communication, but that's fine. Um, so we'll, we did statements of disqualification. Are there any further statements of disqualification? I don't think we need to have um, public comment, but uh, Commissioner, Commissioner Dawson seems interested. Would anyone like to speak on items that are not on tonight's agenda for oral communications? Seeing none, we'll go ahead with the general business. Hi, good evening, everyone. My name's Sarah Noisy, and with me here is Justin Duell. Justin, you are now live to the room. <laughs> um, joining us from um, East Bay, so Justin is uh, an architect with Dolan Architecture. He's been working with us on the, vis the Coral Street Visioning Report. And um, so we're going to talk it through with your commission tonight. and. Um, Starting off with a little bit of background, so um, Coral Street, as most of you I'm sure are aware, everyone in the room is probably aware, it has been um, a longstanding campus for homeless services in the city of Santa Cruz and the county of Santa Cruz. Um, recently, the city acquired 125 Coral Street, um, which is the site of the Seaberg Metals property. They're currently leasing it back, um, but we are interested in um, thinking about how that site can be used to um, augment the services that are currently provided in the area. Um, part of the city's um, homelessness response in recent years has included um, the creation of the Homelessness Response Action Plan, which was adopted about a year ago. Um, and one of the um, action items that came out of that report in the topic area of permanent, affordable, and supportive housing was an action to work 
with partner agencies to deliver a plan for Coral Street Campus and Navigation Center and acquire needed properties. So um, that action is really kind of what spurred our um, efforts here around creating this very high level vision to guide housing creation in the area, um, service and infrastructure investments that um, the city, county and partner agencies and organizations um, may be looking to do in the next decades. So um, we're gonna walk you through that a little bit. Whoop. That's my, maybe. So um, this is a map of the area that we studied for the purposes of this visioning exercise. So this shows the property ownership. So the sites that are shown in purple are currently owned by the city of Santa Cruz. Um, Housing Matters owns the sites that are shown in blue and they are leasing currently the sites shown in green. Um, on some of those, they have an option to purchase. And then um, also of note are the three parcels on the western side of our study area that are not currently owned by a partner or the city. Um, those are held by uh, other private parties and not controlled by any, um, any of the service providers or the city. So um, why are we here tonight with the Planning Commission? So um, this effort at uh, creating a vision for this area was very focused on uh, community participation. And Justin's gonna talk through our community outreach process, the charrette that we went through, the meetings we had with um, service providers that are out there um, working on that campus and providing services to really understand um, you know, what their needs were. But uh, we wanted to come and hear also from your commission, provide you with an opportunity to participate in adding to this vision, shaping this vision. Um, we wanted to provide another opportunity for public comment to get into the record. And then um, any of this feedback that we receive tonight, we'll have an opportunity to incorporate that before we go to council, um, where this will also be sort of a similar informational item. There are no um, binding changes. There are no land use amendments that are um, necessarily a part of this current effort. Um, and so the actions are not formal actions. We don't require a motion tonight. Um, we're just here to kind of have a discussion. If there's a motion that your commission wishes to pass, of course you have that privilege. Um, and so with that sort of setting the stage, I'm gonna pass over to Justin, if I can ever figure out which of my buttons advances the slides. There we go. All right, Justin. Hi, thanks Sarah. Can everyone hear me? Am I coming across well? Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Sarah. Thank you uh, to the commission for, for hearing us this evening. Um, I'd like to just kind of walk you through a little bit of the process and some of the outcomes and results that we came to uh, through the course of this process. Uh, we started in the fall of last year. Um, our, our first effort uh, was in, in, in earnest was, was to, um, to, to meet with a, a group of uh, current service providers in the area, including Housing Matters and, and some others. Um, and, and gather an initial round of feedback. This helped us to um, kind of set the stage and understand both uh, the sort of the, both the current state of the campus and, um, and the, the actions that, that some of these service providers are, um, are, are currently taking, but also some of the future needs and some of the, um, some of the, the uh, essentially the needs that, that we'd be seeking to, um, to, to provide uh, some, some sort of vision or um, guidance for, or uh, future activities or projects that might one day, one day come to light. So, um, with that uh, information that we had gathered uh, in, in December, um, we in, we uh, we undertook our first uh, community outreach process, and this was in the, in the form of a charrette. Um, kind of walk through the timeline here first, then we can flip to some of the, the following slides. Um, so that that was um, early December. Uh, it was it was essentially a, a, a uh, we call it a charrette. It was a very broad kind of information gathering. Uh, community outreach um, process. Uh, we came out of that with a, a lot of great information um, that sort of informed us into a, a phase of um, exploration and actually looking physically at parcels and potential development opportunities um, in, in the form that they could one day take. Um, we, we sort of worked through those, met again with that service provider group, gathered an initial or I guess a secondary round of feedback from them um, and made, made some uh, relatively minor revisions to the um, to the the concepts that we had uh, initially worked through, and and came back in February for a second round um, of presentation and feedback gathering uh, from from the community. 
and so where that puts us today is in the end of March uh, area where we have a draft report prepared um, and we're moving forward into a, a final report uh, feedback and, and report period. I think uh, next slide this is uh, just a, a couple of images from that first initial charrette um, process we, we presented a series of um, uh, project examples uh, case studies and kind of building typologies uh, to help in, inform the general audience about some of the alternatives and options that we had uh, to discuss and, and things that could potentially um, come out of a, uh, a process like this on, um, on some of these development, um, future development opportunities. Um, what we did in, in terms of kind of gathering feedback from this was um, to go around tables. We had uh, some focused topic areas on transportation, urban design, um, architecture, um, and services, services, sorry, architecture, land use, uh, transportation, um, services and urban design and streetscape. Um, so we, we set up, we set up groups, um, we kind of talked through a series of, of predefined questions and we're able to gather a uh, really great round of feedback, um, from the public that, that we took forward and, and analyzed before we. Um, physically looked at the the potential for the the parcels. Um, I think we have a couple of the the, the results of those. We we analyzed the the key topics that have come out of these um, services, in particular, the need for more services was the top item that came out of this initial round. Uh, transportation had a number of different um, permutations that it took in the form of pedestrian safety, uh, shuttles, and alternative transportation means. Um, we looked at um, uh, a, a number of different specific service uh, opportunities, um, such as uh, additional hygiene, additional uh, counseling, uh, the need for simply for safe storage for belongings. And, and so all of these things that came out of this, um, this first round of feedback, um, we, we cataloged the, uh, the, the same set of questions that, that we uh, guided participants through in the in-person survey. We also um, posed online and to and can sort of increase our outreach um, we, we came back from the online survey and um, we saw, a, 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 an, uh, for the most part, we saw a lot of the same results come out of that. We saw, um, in, in particular, the emergence of a, a really strong community centered around the Santa Cruz Rehearsal Studios, and um, that was, you can see, right, sort of right in the center of our work cloud there. That was really one of the, the key elements that we took away from the online survey is that um, there, there really is a strong community and a support base for um, that business and, and that business as it continues to operate um, in the project area. Um, so the finishing out kind of the process, um, we'll go over what the actual uh, development yield studies um, results were um, in a minute, but um, we came back to the community after we had done those um, and, and presented the um, presented the, the, uh, the results. Uh, we did a brief recap of the process. Um, and, and this was really to kind of present the ideas and see what kind of uh, secondary feedback and response came out of that. Um, we heard um, a, a, a number of different um, items come out of that. Uh, some we had heard in the first initial round, some were, were strong reactions to some of the, um, the proposals that, that we presented. Um, there was um, some of the, some of the, um, some of the, the, the key takeaways that we took from that second round were um, again, uh, transportation, but primarily in the form of parking. We really heard um, as a result of some, some of the concepts that we had presented that um, it, had, it had really not solved the had been, it, which is a, a really tricky balance to strike in terms of um, you know, how much land we actually dedicate to something like parking as a trade off for something like more services. Uh, it's a really, really difficult balance to strike, but, but we did hear loud and clear that second time around that that was. That was something that did not appear had really been addressed adequately. Um, so we took, took that as a key takeaway, um, accessibility um, to the project and to the services um, really, really emerged as another, um, another, another key item. Um, and again, we heard about pedestrian safety and sort of um, management of, of, of parking and um, public spaces as something that um, we, we should really further address in any way possible. Um, so I think with that, we'll talk a little bit about, um, what the, uh, actual, um, concepts that came out of our, 
our field study uh, tests were. Um, this is just a quick look at the sort of uh, the extents of the existing um, Housing Matters campus. Um, there's the, the Reveille Family Shelter is, is there and in, in full operation, the Day Services Building um, with the Dining Hall, uh, Dental loft, loft Shelter and, and the Hygiene Bay currently in operation and a, a number of pallet shelters that were actually kind of an emergence of, of the, uh, the, the pandemic, which um, actually had kind of a, a nice outcome, I think, from what we understood was that if, if there was a sort of difference in um, applicability of, of housing and um, sort of a sense of community that those those created that, um, as you'll see in a minute, we kind of keyed off in, in some of our um, proposals. Uh, we're, we're showing at this point in this graphic um, the future location of the Harvey West Studios project, which um, has not has not um, begun construction yet, but we're considering that sort of a key component of what the current campus is uh, because it's, it will imminently be, be constructed. Um, and then there are uh, across the street there, at 801 River, there's a, a, a beautiful uh, Victorian uh, rehab project that Housing Matters has undertaken. It's produced uh, seven um, additional housing units and the uh, Coral Street Plaza, uh, three of those four parcels that are um, currently under lease um, with the option to buy, uh, considering that as a, a current part of the, um, the current campus. Um, so, so first we took a look at what we're calling the key opportunity sites. Um, the first and foremost being, uh, the Seabird Metals property at 125 Coral Street. Um, the site of the former River Street shelter, which is kind of a, a little bit of a, a missing tooth in the sort of, um, overall campus, um, which has recently been closed and is slated for, uh, for demolition. So there's a future opportunity with that parcel. Um, and then those three sites um, that are, are currently under lease uh, across the street um, at 112 through 116 Coral Street. So at, at 125 Coral Street, um, we looked at uh, a, a mixed use multifamily building. Uh, we, we did not um, we did not get too specific with thinking about what sort of population in the future this might serve. When we're looking at the residential component of the site, we looked at essentially just the upper floors being Always for residential, it could take the form of permanent supportive housing. It could take the uh, the shape of family housing or senior housing, depending on what that ultimate population is. It would um, could, could flex into a number of different accounts or or actual build outs. But we did look a lot at the lower levels of that plan um, and ways that uh, some version of non residential spaces could be integrated. Um, the first option looked at at providing as much parking as we really could and sort of parking scenario. Uh, the second option uh, eliminated parking within the building itself and said that adding additional residential and uh, programmable space for services or some future use. Uh, the third option there really expanded that about as much as we could from a um, kind of conventional uh, service space provision and then option four which has emerged as our sort of what we're calling it the preferred option uh, looks at um, actually integrating a navigation center into that building footprint. And so I think we'll, we'll explain that one in just a little bit more detail. Um, what that one could be if, if we were to actually, um, the next slide there is, um, we've introduced maybe a second floor um, and the area shown in, in uh, that kind of orange color there um, would open itself to uh, an actual navigation center um, program. Um, it would require a little bit of an additional um, set of, of access and uh, circulation components of its own to um, work between those two floors. But this was really a result of the, um, the direction that was given by council to explore uh, the expansion of this Coral Street Plaza into to specifically include uh, something in the navigation center model um, that that I, th I think we, we'd seen uh, first in place in the city of San Francisco. So th this was that um, this was that uh, quote unquote preferred option, uh, residential lobby and a real expansion of um, service provider space oriented internally to the campus. Um, so that would be something that would be accessed um, around through the through the main gate coming off of Coral Street um, adjacent to the Reveille family shelter and then the sort of uh, forward facing component of this project at the ground level would, would be this navigation center and so it would be uh, that would be what we would sort of consider our outward face uh, facing Coral Street and add a different sort of programmatic element 
um, to this to the streetscape along Coral Street, and then similar to the other the other projects, uh, nearly fourteen thousand square feet per floor uh, of residential uses, and that would um, presumably be four to five floors of that residential use um, above the the two ground level. <laughs> on the uh, on the River Street shelter, we looked at kind of um, two options that could essentially be a phased sort of a proposal, um, keying off of what what is taking place there uh, already in the, the um, distribution of pallet shelters. Uh, we looked at which has actually kind of a really nice feel when you when you go and, and you experience it. Uh, it has the feel of kind of a, a, a village there, and we thought um, you know we could really kind of capitalize on that and, and build on that um, by expanding that village, creating sort of a common core open space in a, in a sort of very low, low cost, low barrier way to increase the amount of housing with um, you know, a, a very, very low expense compared to what would be a, a big, um, larger building solution. Um, so this, this could be considered an interim solution. This could be considered something that would provide um, some sort of staging area during the construction of Harvey West, um, or it could, could simply provide sort of a, a, a um, an enhanced uh, village of these uh, pallet shelters, um, integrated a little bit of a, a kind of a, a front door for the campus coming through the, the main gate, um, and, and a community space that relates to the existing community space outside of the, uh, the Remley family shelter. And in a sort of a, uh, an option two, which could be a future phase or could be the preferred phase, or you know, there are a lot of different ways that this whole plan could take shape over time. Um, but but we really looked at you know what a what a um, a, a more the, the most efficient use of space would be would, would more than likely be a sort of a similar um, potentially podium style building to what we showed at 125 Coral Street. And uh, this would provide some sort of um, some amount of, of programmable space for services or other uses at the ground floor, again, kind of oriented toward this um, kind of core community open space that we've created um, and then looking at um, several floors of, of residential uses um, above. Looking at the, the sites across the street at Coral Street Plaza, uh, the the buildings highlighted here in blue are the ones currently um, under lease by Housing Matters. Uh, together, it's about 7,000 square feet of space. The sort of option one that we talked about really is just, it, it's its a very low, um, be a low cost or efficient way to come in. And, and essentially, we're saying just reprogram that space, but um, through either tenant improvements or some sort of, of rehab, um, find a way to dedicate that space to additional program where currently use a lot for um, kind of staging storage and, and there's not a lot of active use going out of that space um, but there's quite quite a bit of square footage there that could be programs we really looked at just what, what would be the potential for that um, if we were to just make better use of that space it would be about 7,000 square feet uh, some of the, the numbers that we heard from working through service providers range anywhere from um, maybe 5,000 square feet to 15,000 square feet that was kind of a, a core target for saying we really have the need for this much space. So this could put a dent in that. It's in and of itself, maybe not enough um, all by itself to provide what the ultimate need might be for some of those groups. Um, but it is a pretty good amount of square footage. Um, and that would be, you know, just the, the, the easiest low hanging fruit way to approach that would be, you know, let's just, let's, um, let's actually rehabilitate that and get some, um, some core use happening in that space. The second option, and this looks at the, kind of the idea that um, if the navigation center were not to become a part of the 125 Coral Street project, um, but we wanted to find another location for it, um, there would be some sort of a, a, a version of the uh, the 112 Coral Street parcel, which um, could actually take down a piece of that building, uh, look at a way to re uh, reconfigure parking and access into the site. Um, parking area um, and actually come up with about 16,000 square feet of um, what would be a, a navigation center um, alternative location um, across the street over here and, and 
um, still preserve a little bit of additional programmable space in the, um, the portions of the building at 114 and 116 Pearl Street. And then the, the second uh, sort of layer that, that we looked at are what we're calling future opportunity sites, um, primarily consisting of the, the parcels that there really is no no control um, either by the, by the city or the service providers, but um, takes into account the fact that this is really a vision plan for an entire project area um, and uh, kind of encouraged ourselves to look at the entirety of the project area just from a, a future potential um, we wanted to consider the, the the entire project area and what could happen if all of these sites were to someday come into play. Um, I think the, the first one that we looked at was if we were to be able to one day add 118 Coral Street to the other three parcels there and and assemble all those uh, those pieces together. There's the potential to do a um, a, a larger uh, again here we studied kind of a, a podium type building that could have some parking available at the ground floor. Um, one of the, the pieces that we heard through, um, I think primarily it was through our second community outreach, but we heard it more or less kind of along the way that um, some form of an actual commercial space or commercial use, a real use that could not only serve the sort of the Coral Street population, but also um, provide it's sort of a, either a destination or an asset for people who are looking outside of the project area. Could be a could be a cafe, could be a sandwich shop, could be you know, something that actually provided a little bit of a commercial space, kind of a third place um, gathering. And, and we looked at a way that it, at the ground level that could integrate with some sort of a um, pedestrian plaza, an outdoor space um, that could serve as, as kind of a um, little bit of a destination. Um, so this was really looking at sort of a, um, a commercial residential mixed use opportunity that um, was a little bit different from the others, which were um, more or less uh, combining um, service provider use with residential use. So it's a sort of a different, um, different take on a mixed use building for this area. Uh, 803 River Street is the parcel uh, adjacent to the uh, current um, Victorian uh, renovation that is being worked on. There really is not a lot to do with this parcel. We wanted to consider it, but uh, sort of based on the adjacency of parcels next to it, the ability to assemble this uh, being being with an adjacent parcel being relatively limited. Uh, the thought was that it could um, more or less replicate what had happened next door at 801 River and um, be kind of a, a, a smaller scale, finer grained um, building that can contain uh, several units, but um, kind of in the model of what, what has happened next door at 801. Uh, we looked at 129 Coral Street um, and this was this was in response to what we had heard about parking really being a, a big primary concern, not just for visitors, but for um, for staff. Um, and uh, so we looked initially at um, this one, which has kind of a uh, um, sort of a dead end nature, just because of its limited frontage. Uh, this would more than likely be some sort of assigned parking scenario, um, but kind of a little dead end site like this doesn't work really well for um, public open parking but so this 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 in this uh, option one could be something that would be maybe served um, maybe staff parking or assigned visitor parking um, and option two for this that we just took a look at um, be something like a tiny home village these would be maybe a step up from a pallet shelter these would be um, things like uh, might actually contain a little bit of a a kitchenette and, and actually individual living capabilities in this kind of a tiny home, sort of a tiny home um, building typology. Um, and we, we looked at providing a little bit of forward facing um, community open space, um, you know, sort of semi public, semi private space um, that, that could provide a little bit more. There's another thing we heard that, that there was kind of a lack of gathering spaces, um, community open spaces, places for people to. Um, to come together in, in sort of an informal way. Um, so this was one opportunity to provide something like that as a part of a, a future uh, potential concept. Uh, I think the, la the last site that we took a look at was 133 Fern Street. Uh, this parcel has uh, dual access both from Coral Street and from Fern. Um, so the first thought kind of addressing again the parking need that we heard come up um, 
times was to take a look at this maybe being an opportunity for some public parking. Uh, it's not a dead end lot. It has access from both sides. Um, so like essentially at the capacity they could have, this could you know either be a, um, be an interim solution and a way to land bank this parcel and do something um, while we waited for something, you know, potentially longer term to materialize. Um, so this was just kind of one take on what, the capacity could be if we were to use it for that um, because of the kind of the, the proportions and uh, dimensions of the site, it doesn't particularly lend itself to a residential use. Um, so a, an, an alternative future use for this parcel could be um, looking at, um, a, you know, a, a multi-story uh, programmable space building for service providers could, uh, could yield um, at least 12,000 square feet um, on two floors, um, and this is a, again kind of trying to target that that number that we heard from service providers as a um, potential for um, some some additional um, programmable space in the area. The, the last thing we kind of did was was to take a look at the um, the potential along Coral Street for sort of urban design and streetscape improvements, um, kind of lo looking at at um, Kind of a, a core identity element potentially happening at the, um, the the entry to the existing campus. This could be done pretty simply with things like um, you know just just paint and lighting, <laughs> ready to kind of create a, a community landmark um, and and serve as a little bit of an, an entry monument to the to the campus, the, to the core campus itself. Um, that's what we kind of see in the in the center there. Um, looked at the potential to narrow Coral Street. There's currently no uh, on-street parking allowed. Um, and, and as a result, it just feels feels kind of wide and vast uh, as you go down Coral Street. So um, there's certainly the potential in you know, keeping enough uh, space there as an opportunity for through traffic, um, but the ability to you know, potentially uh, pull, the, pull the curbs in, um, capture some of that space within the right-of-way um, both by adding trees to soften the streetscape, but maybe even something like uh, community garden pockets between those trees um, and, and sort of put together all the concepts that we looked at in a way that you kind of got a sense for what, what the future of, of both, um, you know, kind of semi-public and semi-private space might be to create um, you know, kind of a, a real sense of there being a, a community and um, some, some activity and gathering, both formal and informal spaces uh, along Street to create a real kind of sense of a destination of a place. Thanks, Justin. <clears throat> um, okay, so kind of finishing off with those future sites, I think um, leads us right into implementation and phasing. And I would just like to emphasize that site control is one of the most important pieces in terms of determining our next steps. And so just to say again, we don't control any of those future sites. So those really are very like hypothetical potential scenarios, right? Um, what we do control uh, is the all of those sites that are shown in blue on that initial um, property ownership map. So uh, most significantly is 125 Coral, um, which is the site the city has most recently acquired. Um, we do think that that will be the first one to redevelop sort of following 119, which is already entitled and just recently got um, fully funded. So um, we're expecting that um, construction to um, hopefully get kicked off by the end of the year. Um, but so next in line will be 125 Coral. And um, so that's why for that site, we actually do kind of have a preferred development option that includes the navigation center. So we're trying to be responsive to that um, direction that came out of the HRAP and um, like find a location to that can accommodate sort of that, um, you know, 15,000 ish square feet that you would want for a use like that. Um, then we kind of then we expect River Street shelter will be sort of the next in line to develop and we have sort of two options about how that might happen. Um, and um, as Justin mentioned, that's going to depend on the funding, that's going to depend on the needs um, for the community, that's going to depend on um, uh, co uh, institutional capacity to sort of manage uh, some kind of development project or um, accommodate additional pallet shelters or some other third use that might need to um, kind of come in there 
in the interim. So um, as Justin mentioned also, Coral Street Plaza can be used as is, so any redevelopment that might happen there would have to involve um, the Santa Cruz Rehearsal Studio. They are co-owners of that parking facility in that location. They've been very clear that they intend to continue operating their business in that location. So um, if anything were to change on that site to significantly redevelop any part of it, they would have to be part of that conversation. Um, so in terms of land use actions, um, the state law actually allows for um, several of the uses that we've considered here to be um, created through a ministerial review process, which would in essentially mean that there's not um, a public hearing required. They could kind of go straight to applying for a building permit, and they would go through um, just a plan, like a zoning plan check review in terms of planning. Um, those are all summarized in the report in section four in more detail. The city may opt to go ahead and redesignate um, the 125 parcel to um, the CC zone, our, our community commercial zone, because it just kind of gives us more options and it does minimize this um, potential um, conflict with the general plan that even though it's allowed under the state law, the general plan kind of discourages it and it's just a little awkward. So um, to be determined exactly how we, we would proceed on that. Um, and then the other thing I want to mention about implementation and phasing is that um, parking is a problem that we can that we kind of need two solutions. We need to solve it on paper, and then we need to like solve it in real life. <laughs> and um, the state laws do give us lots of options for like solving it on paper, right? The state density bonus law um, sort of el can eliminate parking requirements, at least for housing uses. There are um, some other tools in, in, under state law that really reduce parking requirements. And so that kind of solves the paper problem around parking, but it doesn't address the on the ground issue. So that is something that um, any development that comes in here is gonna need to grapple with. Um, so there are several tools that could potentially be available and it's kind of in order of preference, in order of like, um, usability, those would be to in encourage, require, not encourage, require those new developments to use transportation demand management tools. So providing transit passes, providing extra bike parking, providing, you know, shared, you know, a bike share facility at that location to reduce the number of cars that are driving to the site. Um, we could pursue additional, um, the city could partner with um, the other agencies out there to find more off-site parking agreements. So there are some already in place, some off-site parking agreements for staff and um, uh, people who are staying like long-term on the site. So we could pursue more of those with other businesses in the area. Um, then another option would be to partner with existing businesses to actually build new parking on their sites that then um, the Coral Street campus could have a portion of those, lease a portion of those, or get dedicated a portion of those in exchange for helping to develop the facility. And then the um, business would also get some you know, amount of more parking that they were interested in. And then the last option would be to actually acquire land to build parking lots. So. Um, additionally, public realm improvements are also included here as part of the vision, again, at a very high level. So um, Metro is actually right now reevaluating their service. They're, they're doing the whole reimagine Metro process, which they had a very exciting public meeting just a couple of weeks ago. Um, and they're, they're really doing a lot of good research to think about how can they um, make their service both more efficient for users as well as more efficient for them to operate. So um, that is an ongoing process that the city is participating in. And um, we got lots of really good suggestions from the public around transit and creative ways that transit could be used to better support this area. So we are communicating those to Metro and passing those along into that process. Um, and then the other piece is that the city, it's time for the city to update excuse me, our active transportation plan, which is a, an effort that is headed out of the Public Works Department. And we've already had some discussions about how we can prioritize this area, particularly the intersection of highways one and nine um, to increase safety, because there have been a couple of pedestrian fatalities in that area um, recently. And so safety for all the movements going through that intersection is still something that um, we need to work on is particularly for um, non-automobile um, actors through that intersection. So um, 
we're at a stage now where we're pursuing grant funding to be get, to start working on that active transportation plan and we will continue to stay involved with that um, as it develops over the next year, 18 months, two years, something like that. Um, so that kind of summarizes and covers everything that is in the draft, the vision report. And um, at this point, as I mentioned earlier, there's no formal action that we're requesting from your um, commission. We're here to have a discussion and hear from you and answer any questions that you have and sort of take your input into this document. Um, and then following that, we will be taking this to the city council in April or May for um, in a similar fashion as an informational item for them to sort of accept the report and then provide direction relating to next steps. Um, at that time. So um, with that, we're Justin is here for questions and staff is here for questions. All right, thanks. So this isn't like technically a public hearing, but I think we'll just follow that same format. If, if commission has questions for staff, ask them, then we'll open it up and hear from the public, and then we'll bring it back for some more discussion up here. So are there uh, questions for staff from the commissioners? Everybody's good? So I had one, I like cheer when I see streets being taken over. So I love that one where Coral's getting narrower and narrower. Does, did it, you ever think of or study just closing it off entirely? I mean, I know this was studied with the big intersection thing. My memory is like, you can't quite do it traffic count wise. So, so we did, we did, we discussed a lot of different options in the charrette. Um, I mean, and we were really at that point, we weren't bringing any vision, right? We were asking the community to tell us what their preference was. And we really heard the whole range of preferences and ideas about like, let's just close the whole road off, make it a cul-de-sac, run the circulation through the alley and out Fern. Um, don't change anything about it except bring the parking back. Um, make it one way going out from Limekiln out to river yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, narrow it so that it's really just one lane. And um, ultimately, we we heard from you know, some of the existing businesses that are already in the area. There are a couple of issues there. The circulation through the alley, um, that alley is pretty narrow, and there's, a, yeah. there's actually a little bit of debate about whether it's, like, fully publicly owned. So um, the alley is a little bit tricky. And then the, um, these, there's these existing businesses that are in yeah, that yeah. area that, you know, want to continue to operate and, like, run, you know, Granite Rock runs trucks, right, in and out of that um, facility at 129. So um, at this point, we think that two-way circulation is still kind of um, necessary and really the best option in that area. So we can narrow it so that it's um, not quite as fast, right, and make some other kind of changes to the roadway, um, but still offer two-way circulation so that there, you know, folks can access that neighborhood and get in and out in the ways that they're accustomed to without overloading adjacent roadways. Thank you for reminding me of the existing people there with businesses, because that's important. So then I, I'm trying to remember setbacks between the IG zoning and like the CC are there, can we do zero lot line in one of those and not the other? Or would that have to be changed? I'm sorry, I should I know don't, this by now. No, I actually don't know the answer to that. I know in the CC you can do a zero lot line when it's adjacent to CC. Yeah. I think you probably can when it's adjacent to any non-residential use. Okay. Um, I actually don't know the IG setbacks off the top of my head. They're probably different. And that may be something that we want to think about in, in terms of like, do we rezone, do we go ahead and like rezone, redesignate yeah. that one so parcel? That might be a, next, a possible next step. Right. A lot of those little puzzle pieces just seem to be really squished down by their setbacks to me. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Those are my questions. Uh, can I get a, just a show of hands, like roughly who from the public would like to speak? I'd just like to get a count so we can see if we need to limit the time. Okay, four or five. Um, so we'll do three minutes for public comment. And welcome, thanks for coming. This is why we're here, is to listen to you all. Um, if you wanna come on up, that'd be great. Uh, we limit the time to three minutes, uh, just so people don't go on and on. And uh, staff is getting the, there's a little yellow light that should come on when your time is getting to the end. Sounds good.
testing. Okay. All right, and if people want to come up, if the, the next speaker could just line up over here at the side, that helps us move along quicker. Hi, I'm Kurt Talley. My mom owns the Quonset Huts at the end of Coral Street. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering, I know I got here a little late and I apologize, but how far is this project going to extend and is it planned in the future to go all the way down to the, use the whole street? But we normally don't do a back and forth, but there was a diagram shown with the with the boundary of the of the project. That's the current project boundary. Am I able to get it, get it, get that? Yeah, uh, connect with with staff here, and they can give you the information. And they're open at any time for questions and to meet with you. Mm -hmm. Hi there, my name is Alexandra McCoy. I'm a land use specialist at Granite Rock. And so I just wanted to go on record saying that we do oppose planning over our parcel. It's directly adjacent to our larger industrial site and we're aware that this is gonna be a public document and um, it will continue to exist past uh, this planning process. Um, and then also just to point out that, you know, we're highly aware of the constraints of this small area where these necessary services are trying to be planned. But we also just wanted to highlight the fact that directly across River Street, the city of Santa Cruz does currently own parcels there. And I know it could be logistically challenging, but it is possible to create uh, an underpass essentially connecting Coral to that site, and that would eliminate certain um, pedestrian safety issues that got brought up. You could create more parking on some of the limited land, and it would allow people to be able to access the site that are currently using the levy, which is gonna be some of the clients. So we just wanted to bring that up as something for future considerations. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, hi, my name is Michael Wood. I'm a business owner on Fern Street in the Quonset Hut that his, his mom owns. Mm -hmm. And uh, we pose, a, there's a lot of challenges for us as business owners in that neighborhood. Um, just last week, I had to clean up feces and, and this kind of thing. And, and I'm wondering, is there a facilities plan for this? or Because the, the people need a place to go to the bathroom and it's just, it's really, it's really difficult to have a business in that area. People are scared to be there, they're, you know, and it's a hygiene issue for us, and, and that's just kind of what I want to bring up. And the parking issue as well. Because we have on-street parking, and the people that in the facility park on Fern Street, which takes away our parking, and that's the comments that I I don't remember. Is there parking on that on your, on your parcel also? Yeah, it's it's spotted. Like one or two. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's, there's only a few parking spaces. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jennifer Gallagher, also a long-standing business owner on Coral Street at actually 118 Coral. So I am co-owner of Santa Cruz Rehearsal Studios that you've heard about. Um, and I just want to go on record. Um, I want to thank you for having the public comment and go on record for a few things I'd like the commission to consider. Um, one is that for me, this project study is really lacking a high level vision to address the current challenges of the neighborhood as expressed by some of our other neighbors. Um, this expansion would just exacerbate those challenges. Things like tricky parking um, and the fact that it looks okay on paper on the ground, this is a huge issue today. So I was, uh, I liked seeing that there were parking issues for this future plan, but why aren't we doing them today if they're possible? Because today there is no parking. Today people are shooting up on the street. Today people are defecating. These are problems that are happening right now. So I don't understand how this vision jumps the problems of today and creates a utopia that doesn't exist in my mind. Um, I also want to continue to address the Coral Street Plaza that, and the fact that 118 Coral continues to be included in this plan, much like 129 Granite Rock or Granite Rock's property, 129. Um, the fact is that it is not for sale. 
The fact is it is an industrial condo complex, so the leasing of the three buildings does not allow for any um, expansion without our participation, and we do not want to participate. Um, these, this vision has real life effects for us right now. It is damaging our business to continue to be associated as part of the Coral Street um, Homeless Service Center uh, plaza, like campus. Um, we already have to fight for our limited parking with staff and with clients who believe that we are part of the campus because we continue to be included in this vision. Um, uh, thank you. Hello, my name is Nathan Van Zant, and I'm a business owner at 138 Fern Street, Shanty Shack Brewing. Uh, and we have, we're always battling parking. Uh, it seems like since uh, two months after we opened when the parking got changed to uh, permit parking only. When I walk the street and look at all those permits, I see that most of the street is coming from Homeless Service Center, which has zero parking on their street. So I appreciate that your plan includes some parking spots, but I'm concerned that uh, those parking spots are only designated on the parcels that are future or proposed things. And so if this project goes through and those project and those par properties don't get acquired, then we could end up with a big project without with putting even more stress on the parking situation. Uh, so I urge you to decide on making decisions that include parking from the get-go uh, to help solve the problems that we're currently dealing with right now. Um, We've, yeah, we've been, I mean, I'm also concerned about a little bit of just the, you know, uh, intention of the community and the area there. Uh, we already have, it seems like, kind of changed the concept of what it means to go to Harvey West as a residential and a commercial area, um, apart from it being industrial um, and having a bigger homeless presence. Might, uh, might kind of backslide on our ability to be able to continue business and have the public feel safe. Uh, so I just want to go on record and let those considerations be known. Thanks. Hi, um, my name is Portia. Thank you for your time today. Um, I work at Housing Matters, and so I want to address some of the, you know, concerns uh, raised today about safety and that um, the more we treat people like people the and the less we treat them as some other I think the farther we will go so I want to encourage us to push farther with this plan we have presented today and see um, if we can actually uh, envision a future where we include the people not as a shelter like a warehouse but um, as people as our community members that are unfortunately you know being pushed out and don't have an, a place to live currently and um, so if we are keeping that in mind and keeping our businesses in mind and keeping our ideas of both of these thriving together um, I think the more we look at what people are doing in terms of like incorporating um, cooperative, tenant-owned, tenant, um, you know, functioning, centered housing um, that would go a long way and give people and in incorporating, like, job training, all these sorts of things, even potentially with businesses. And um, and thinking, I encourage you all to think seriously about the, con the concerns of the businesses as well and that, you know, we want thriving businesses and how can the city you know, if this isn't a place that they want to be, be, you know, somewhere where they are welcomed and included in a space as well. And, uh, but I don't think it has to be either or. I think that there is a solution where both can exist together. And I encourage all of us to think in a way that we are meeting the needs of human beings and such as needing a bathroom, needing a place to have um, sanitary resources is really important but also being treated like a person not a plague um, not being treated and dehumanized to homeless you know these are human beings and um, as studies have shown like a lot of most people are paycheck away from 
being homeless. So, you know, it really just speaks to supporting all the way around housing, permanent housing, temporary housing, and um, from like temporary supportive housing as well. And even just not naming something a shelter might change the vibe. You could ask the people what the space that they could be living in, what they want it to be called. Um, there's a lot of options. And I couldn't hear the presentation, and I hope next time the volume could be a little louder because I wanted to hear if the, if the flood evacuation warning was taken into account because I do think that the safety of the people that are going to be there is, should also be taken into concern as well. Thank you again for your time, and I really appreciate this project moving forward. Thank you. All right, if there's no more public comment, I'll uh, close the public comment part of the hearing and bring it back to the commission for some discussion. Commissioner Dawson. Uh, yeah, thank you all for coming, first of all. Um, I have other comments, but I, I'm just hoping that we could um, address the private parcels being in the planning area. I'm very uncomfortable with that, and I, I'm hopeful that I could just make a motion so it's a more formal recommendation. So I'd like to put a motion on the floor to exclude um, the private parcels. And staff, could you just confirm I get this right? 133 Fern Street, 129 Coral Street, and 118 Coral Street. Um, I just would like to put a motion on the floor to exclude those from the planning area. So that line would exclude those parcels and uh, just put that up for uh, motion. I definitely second that. All right. Uh, we have a motion and a second. Is there further discussion? Yeah. Um, I, um, I'm i sorry that motion got moved, made so quickly. I was hoping we could have a discussion about that um, uh, a, little, a little bit more informally. Um, uh, what I was going to say is that it is obviously really important. And first of all, I want to say thank you for, oh, sure, sorry. Computer gets in the way. Uh, sorry about that. This is a huge planning process, and I think there's a lot of pieces of it that, that you know, we can provide a lot more discussion about. Um, I felt like I think that um, having the whole area be vibrant as an industrial area, as a commercial area, with some you know really interesting and vital businesses going on, and also an intensifying homeless services area, um, is the big problem that needs to get solved. And I'm and I think that this planning process or this this high level planning process is trying to do just that. Um, what I felt like as I saw these these services, I mean. Granite Rock is really important. The Quonset Huts are in the, um, I didn't know about the brewery going on down there, but um, all of those businesses that have always you know, gone down there as long as I've known the area are really important. Um, the concerns that people brought up are vitally important. Um, addressing parking down there is, I mean, we can hear um, from everybody who came tonight and anybody who's ever worked there can talk about how important it is to talk about that. And not just for I mean, it, it's important for the whole of Harvey West, um, and to you know have it continue to be important. Um, I felt like having those parcels be looked at as uh, be acknowledged as being as the adjacency is not a bad thing. I don't see them as no one's going to swoop in and um, do some eminent domain on those projects. I think planning for their health and vitality is what this project should be doing. So in other words, I am concerned about parking for the Quonset Hut businesses. And because um, I, th I think that matters to the acceptability of the um, homeless corner um, for the com whole community, there should be a bathroom all the time. I mean, it's appalling that we haven't solved that problem. Um, and um, that and, and other emergency services. So this process, I do believe, is the right thing that we should be doing. Um, I don't know that, I, I don't see what the effect would be um, to make the planning, the high level planning better if they were excluded. They're still adjacent. 
you know, nothing has changed about, you know, the underlying legalities of that. Um, I assume it's a, it's a, some sort of a condominiumized um, commercial space. It's not changed if the line is drawn differently. Um, and what I would say is that um, planning for its health should be part of this project because it isn't just homeless services. We're really, pl it's, it's um, higher level than that. And I mean, planning for the health of Granite Rock and you know, in the intersections and the traffic and all of those pieces, I thought they made, brought up some interesting, I don't know if it's feasible or not ideas, but thinking about what everybody needs down there is part of what the project should, should be. So um, I'd love to hear an argument that excluding them is gonna do a better job of um, protecting the overall needs of the area. Yeah, I'm interested in that too, Commissioner Dawson. Yeah, so um, I, I agree that we need to be planning for the health of, the, of this whole area. And, and part of that is having the support of local businesses, especially the local businesses that are directly adjacent to this area. Um, so the public process and the planning process is not going to exclude those businesses because we draw the line differently in this plan. However, it is going to um, encourage those businesses to be more proactive, more engaged, and supportive of this process. And so it's a very simple thing. I absolutely agree that drawing the line doesn't change the legalities at all, but it is something that businesses are asking for. They're not gonna be excluded by changing this line. And I really feel like that, that it shows us goodwill that we are doing exactly what Commissioner Conway said, is planning for a, a vibrant and successful area for both the homeless services and the businesses down there. Um, and it's not just the directly adjacent businesses, it's the businesses on Fern Street and in that whole area. Again, those businesses aren't excluded. It's more like on a political, from a political stance than from a planning stance? Well, like th there is no official, I mean, this is not a binding document, right? right. But it, it is showing goodwill to the businesses that we are, we are doing what we say we are doing, which is having a public process that is trying to plan for the health of the whole area, including the small businesses. They're asking for us to, in this visioning document, change the way we've drawn a line. And I think that that is a small, um, it, it, it's a small gesture to show that uh, we really want their support. We really want them to be a part of this process and we're gonna continue down listening to them. Um, and again, it doesn't change the legalities, it doesn't change the process necessarily, but it does show these businesses that we've heard them and that, that we want their support and we wanna hear them as we go forward. Uh, I'm still digesting all that. Commissioner Paul Hamas. Yeah, just a question. Um, <clears throat> have we, has the city had any type of dialogue with these businesses over the visioning plan? Or is this sort of, this is the first I'm hearing of some of these businesses, um, you know, not wanting to be included aside from Granite Rock? Yeah, we met with both um, Granite Rock and with the Santa Cruz rehearsal studios. And we did hear that from them that they, you know, would prefer not to be shown within the line on the map. Um, and, you know, I think this is just one of those hard realities about planning is that, you know, our responsibility is to d make good logical decisions on the part of the whole community. And, and I understand why someone might be concerned. And so um, hopefully we've been able to kind of talk that through and just really explain the, the purpose and the range of this plan that it really could be, you know, 40 years. And then also on top of that, you know, we have all kinds of plans that never get to full fruition, right? Like that planning is extremely important and executing every molecule of a plan is really less important. The idea, what's important is that we have thought comprehensively about this neighborhood. So um, yes, we have we have spoken to the, to the folks that are within the project area. We have not spoken um, individually with any businesses outside of the project area. Well, Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's like if the downtown plan of total fitness wasn't into it and was like, yeah, we're out of this plan area, it just seems very arbitrary and slippery to me to start, like, 
staff did a good job defining the boundaries are based on those streets or the edges of the neighborhood. And I think we should stick with that. So uh, let's call a roll call vote on Commissioner Dawson's motion. Commissioner Dawson? Aye. Commissioner Conway? Well, I'm, I'm for a lot of the concepts in it, but I'm going to vote against it because I don't feel like it's appropriate to what we're doing right now. Commissioner Palmas? No. Commissioner Maxwell? Aye. Commissioner Kennedy? No, I'm convinced it will serve the businesses better to be part of the plan than to be excluded. As a comment, I'm also remembering when Seaberg Metals was the one that was pissed off about the homeless shelter and was never going to participate in the process. So here we are with control of that process, that parcel. So that's an example right there on that street where, you know, if you keep working with the process, things change over the years. I might be misremembering the details there, but. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, I, I mean, I guess maybe we, we're, we are there with, there's a lot of things to talk about in here and a lot of things for feedback. And I think one thing that, um, you know, we're, and there, there's no um, land use proposals before us. There's no project per se before, per, before us tonight, um, um, except for, you know, maybe we want to comment on that um, possibly changing to um, community commercial. But, I mean, that's that's very different from what we're talking about in terms of actually proposed project. We're just kind of dreaming. And one of the things that um, I see in this is that um, I'm glad that the city is considering that um, we have this enormous problem and um, how we look at it changes over time. And, you know, we've seen it change from being sort of shocked by it in the early 80s and throwing, treating it just like it was an emergency. So if we do shelters, then it's everything, every, it's gonna go away and then, oh no, that's not enough. So we need 24 months, okay, then we'll solve it. Well, that doesn't work. Permanent supportive housing, you know, um, tenant-based rental assistance and, you know, navigation centers, you know. But um, the thing that seems to me to be just crucially important is that we need land to provide services. We need to plan for it well. And the fact that there's master planning going on here is really important, um, and incredibly important, and I'm so gr glad that we're seeing it. But the other thing is that um, this is absolutely not gonna be a benefit to the community if it doesn't involve um, the whole neighborhood. And really, it's a bro the broader community as well because there's the businesses that are being run down there, but it's also the whole rest of the region that's visiting down there to Costco or Little League games or, I mean, you know, on and on. It's a, it's a really important part of the city, and it's a huge thing to change from an industrial area and have these, you know, kind of, you know, now permanent residences and as well as the transitional residences and the many people that move through there. And um, so I think it's just, it's a really important part of the process and um, I'm glad it's going on. So I am supposed to summarize as chair that that motion failed three to two and I forgot to do that. Um, so more discussion, we don't have to do motions, we can just give ideas to staff. Um, I've got a few to talk about, or? Yes, I. Um, so, <laughs> I just think this is a great study. I appreciate the work and all the, you know, how the pieces were looked at in different configurations. It seems like that, um, oh, I'm forgetting the word right now, but the initial center is so important, and I really like the ones that were, that showed that in a prominent location on either site. I'm just blanking on what it's called. The Navigation Navigation Center, navigation center thank you. Um, yeah, parking is just so hard around here and hearing everyone speak to it like the business owners who I'm assuming want people to come and park and enjoy their businesses and that's just hard in that neighborhood. So I'm like feeling like we need parking here more than almost any time when I sit up here at the Planning Commission. So there's that. Um, I'm working on a lot of projects in my day job that are affordable housing. I'm noticing how important the transportation components are for pursuing this state funding. 
So I see that coordination happening already. But I really think if we can start linking like bus stops, you know, uh, staff does a great job of this already. But maybe that would be a way to get some more money into this master plan area. You know, I can't think of ones off the top of my head, but there are a lot of connectors and routes that could be improved that might make the whole package or each project even more strong. I, um, I'm just thinking of Camp Ross and like how hard it was to drive by that over and over. So I want to say that all of these are just awesome compared to that. So thank you for bringing that. And uh, those are my comments. Go ahead. Um, so first of all, I just really would like to take a moment to thank staff for bringing this to us and the whole process because um, I agree with the comments that this is an incredibly important area. Um, so I just have a hodgepodge of things here and I'll just get them all out at once. Um, so again, I just want to um, state clearly to the public um, and on the record that regardless of how the project area is drawn on the map, we know that this is um, majorly going to have cascading effects around to other businesses. So I just encourage folks in the public to continue to follow this. Council has the ultimate decision, so please make sure that you're making your comments to council as well. Um, we're just making recommendations tonight. Um, so uh, on to the hodgepodge. Um, uh, I did have one quick question that I forgot. Um, so. Have we got as far as envisioning how many beds that the navigation center would have? Um, I, think, I think that you can answer that question. Justin, he has hard, a hard time hearing the audio in here. Um, do we know, could, can you remind us how many beds the navigation center could hold? Justin. <laughs> Hi, there, sorry. I'm there you go. Um, yeah, I, I can compare it to a similar project of ours that, that we've worked on that was um, approximately 12,000 square feet, uh, accommodated 125 beds in a short-term shelter. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. I would just say my overarching um, comment is that we, we we need to certainly maximize the amount of units that we have available. Um, short-term is part of that, but also long-term permanent housing. Um, is, is something that I think is really critical. Um, the co-location of services is, is very, um, very important, and we know that that works. Uh, finding a space for HPHP um, is, is, I know that's part of the vision, but I just want to put it on the record. Um, I know people who work in this field, and, and it's just a critical part of the services in that area. Um, making sure that they have the space um, will uh, be a, a really important part of the services provided. Um, I, I also, as we move forward, I know we're at the visioning stage, but as the projects actually take shape, um, it, it's really going to be critical to talk to the unhoused community. Um, I didn't see, I know that there was a shred and some unhoused people could come there, but I think there should be more of a formal effort to include them into um, you know, I think that they're the best at telling us, especially the barriers to services in addition to the types of services that they need. I think it goes both ways, the service providers and the unhoused community. Um, you know, the more we get it right with uh, the, the level of service that is needed there the, and, and the, making sure that they're accessible is going to be better for everyone. These issues that are are being brought up by the businesses and the people around there, if we can have the services, the bottom line issue is that the need is way higher than the services we have. That's that's that is the crux of it. So the the better we can be efficient and effective, and that starts with the unhoused community. Um, other people that came to mind is the free guide. Um, I didn't see them formally reached out to. I also just want to bring out. Um, that we talked about state and county partners. Um, you know, there there is a huge federal partner that wasn't talked about, and I know this is just for veterans, but they have over 400 vouchers here in the county of Santa Cruz. So the HUD uh, VA supported housing, 
um, should be part of these conversations. They're in that community all the time. Um, and, and, you know, they are a bit of the poster child of how supported housing can work. Um, so, so they're good, um, they're good partners, I think. Um, there's also community mutual aid groups that um, interact with the unhoused community. Uh, they should be part of this conversation. I think a formal reach out to them should, would be really important. Um, and I think that's the end of the hodgepodge. So thank you. Yeah, great comments. I want to second uh, talk to the people there. I don't know. If I could just respond on that yep. point. So, so thank you, Commissioner Dawson, for that. Um, I'm, I was not aware about the um, VA supportive housing program, so thank you so much for mentioning that. And I did just want to um, make sure that everyone was aware that we, we did make sure that we had folks with lived experience of homelessness at the, that first charrette. Um, and then also there were um, a number of them that also attended the second community meeting. So that was really important to us, and we didn't mention it in the, in the presentation, so I just wanted to make sure we had probably 60 participants, I think, in the charrette, 50 or 60, and a dozen of them were folks who had lived experience. Yeah, that's great. Um, it's yeah, just it cer certainly we should continue to make them a priority. Absolutely. All right, any other thoughts? Uh, thank you to staff for that really comprehensive viewpoint of uh, what could be someday. Um, I just, I also have kind of a hodgepodge of comments. Um, I, I would just start with there are a lot of competing interests in this uh, project area. And for me, um, in, in my unprofessional opinion, I think that if people don't have per, or stable shelter, um, you can throw a lot of services at them and the chances of them permanently rehousing, I think, are, are pretty low. So I think that, um, you know, maximizing the, the short-term and long-term residential uses is definitely going to be really important. And I also think that parking is, uh, I would just repeat what most people have said around here, in this particular area, I think that parking is a little bit more important, not only to the businesses, but also to um, you know, the, the staff, uh, the people that attend the SCRS, things like this. And I also think that it provides an interesting opportunity to explore whether a safe parking program makes sense in this area so that it can be used by businesses and staff for the uh, uh, Homeless Services Center by day and then potentially a safe parking program at night. Um, maybe that makes sense there, maybe it doesn't, maybe something to explore. Um, I also think that um, I'm really excited about some of the, the permanent supported housing units that are going in the back of the of the campus there, uh, West, what, Harvey West Studios? Yes, Harvey West Studios. So I, I really support this type of housing, and I think it's going to be a real game changer um, for, for many people. And I also support, uh, you know, looking at other housing options uh, where the uh, shelter building is, and that's... Uh, scheduled to be demolished. I think that those are all really good um, opportunities to take a look at how we provide shelter um, in the short term and the long term to people who really need it. I also really like the tiny homes idea. That looks awesome. I know that's way off in the future um, and that may not be a good fit for everybody, but I, I really like tiny homes. I think that's a great, um, a great direction to head. Um, my last thought was just about Coral Street. Um, <clears throat> the in in some of the uh, appendices, there was a lot of talk about closing Coral Street off, or you know, making changes to the way that traffic flowed on Coral Street. And um, for me, I think that as in the event that the Coral Street campus across um, to the north is actually developed into more of a you know as a more uh, integrated part of the entire campus, I think maybe making it a one way. Um, from Lime Kiln down to uh, River might make sense. I just think that as people are, you know, crossing back and forth across Coral Street, um, as the place becomes more populated, as more people are entering this area, um, it might, you know, make sense to have direction flow one way from the Costco area down down to River Street. And then also, um, you know, it there is no left from River right there, so I think that even if you made it into a one way, it wouldn't necessarily inhibit, um, you know, people from coming into that area either on firm or on uh, Ansel. So I think that pretty much sums it up. Um, yeah, thank you guys so much for great presentation. Thank you. All right. All right. Well, I just want to also say um, thanks to staff 
um, for having this because uh, sometimes we don't get the chance to like actually talk about these things before they happen and still just comes to us as it's happening. So it's really nice to be part of the planning, visioning, more, more or less, and to also include the public to have a second to come in and talk to us about the vision, um, which I, I appreciate everybody that's come here today. Um, a lot of what was said I agree with most. I mean, Commissioner Dawson summed up almost all of it. Um, I agree. I think uh, Coral Street be, becoming a one-way makes a, a ton of sense. I've, I mean, I've been over there a bunch. Not many people are making left-hand turns off of river or can <laughs> ever. So um, that makes a lot of sense. Um, as far as the Navit, it's nice to have all the services be in one spot. Um, I was wondering what parcels of across from River Street do that does the city own? I remember the person from Granite Creek mentioning that. So um, there are, we don't have a map of that handy, um, but so uh, across the street is the central home site. Yep, yep. And that um, site is really three separate legal parcels. Okay. And so the city currently owns two of them and one of them is owned by Caltrans. Okay, great. Yeah, I mean, I would love to see as, you know, the more we make this area like, and like we're this. The, it's only going to make us better. This is only going to improve what's there already. Um, and we listening to the people that are in that area. I mean, I know I've been to the businesses in that area. I've you know drive go. Of course, everyone somehow goes to Costco. I try not to, but I go too. Um, but and you know there are a bunch of problems there right now. And I I want to acknowledge that we hear heard from people tonight saying there's a problem right now that needs to be addressed. And this is all fun that we get to talk about what we get to like think about making, but it sounds like there's some actions that possibly could help alleviate some of the problems now. Um, I'm not the mastermind of planning to know what those answers are, but it would be nice to see if we could, because you know, as we're, this is a project that we're looking forward to in years and years in the future, um, somehow, helping the, the businesses there now. Um, so I'd be interested to see how, you know, what we could come up with that would, you know, obviously it can't be something permanent that's gonna affect the long-term vision, but maybe something that we can find in temporary level. Um, other than that, I, the other thing too was the idea of having the, the, uh, the occupants and the people living there be part of the naming process, I think is really great. That's a great idea. I would love to see that happen at least so that people are proud of that space and they, they really claim it as their own, you know, so that, I would love to see that. Um, other than that, I think that's it. Thanks. A couple more. All right, Commissioner Conway. Sorry, I know I talked about a couple things, but that's I didn't right. do my hodgepodge. <laughs> and, um, and um, yeah, again, thank you for taking this on. It's just really high time to do it. And there are a couple of things that I really liked that you did. I actually think that Coral Street should be two-way, but have no right turn so that you can't um, go out on, I, that was listed somewhere, and I said, people, there's circulation on the street, but you have to get there a different way. I don't know. To me, that made a lot of sense. And a lot of the transportation ideas for managing it down there, some of them were like, well, yeah. And one of them is, why can't people get on an on a bus that's done with its service and take you know go down to where it's going to get parked all night? I read that one and it's like that seems so incredibly simple, you know. Yeah, maybe you, you know, just that's going out of service. That's where it's going. Walk from the yard even. They don't have to make a stop. But I mean, I I thought that was a good example of the kind of creative thinking that really needs to happen because that walk gets really long. You know, and it gets especially really long. I mean, everybody knows that people who are homeless have an incredibly high incidences of all kinds of physical problems. So I just thought that was a nice and simple one. Um, and there's only so much you can do about, about managing the demand. Um, there's going to be a bunch of people working there. There's going to be a bunch of people of all different skill levels working there. And, um, n you know, not everyone is privileged to be able to ride their bike from the west side, you know, to go to work down there. Um, and parking is just really important. And so it sort of broke my heart a little bit as I'm looking at it because I know how badly we need a uh, space for a navigation center and for services. But I really think that if we don't address the parking issue down there, um, 
you know, it's, it's not going to be successful. <coughs> and um, another thing that I loved that you did is to, um, I, first of all, acknowledge what a great community can um, arise around pallet shelters and um, just that small space. And it's, it's a wonderful, healthy community, making some, out, some green space where people can hang out. That, that always was the case with Page Smith Community House and its former incarnation and in, you know, its newer incarnation. There's even a little bit of it. So having just a hangout space, a little bit of public space, um, I loved that. And I also loved um, thinking about that it is going to change over time. You're going to tear down that, uh, you know, the River Street Shelter, which has really been held together by termites holding hands for a long time, you know. And so, you know, right away, more pallet shelters. That makes good sense, you know. And, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to change over time. Our response to this problem is going to change over time. So I, I loved that. Um, I thought the community garden in between trees, making narrow, you know, Coral Street narrower, um, was a sweet idea too. Um, and uh, let's see, um, safe storage absolutely vital. Um, one thing that we, we we aren't going very granular on the type of services that are provided, and I know that's not really our role, but it was mentioned at one point, which is medical detox. You know, we haven't had that space and. It would save lives. It would make such a difference. It would um, reduce the impact on our ER and on our jail, and um, it's just more compassionate. And I'm gonna, you know, I know that's that was uh, mentioned a couple of times. And uh, oh, and finally, I guess the partnerships for shared parking. Um, Mike brought that up, and um, I think some ways to solve the parking problem together. It would have to be intensively managed. I know there's been some false attempts, or failed attempts, I should say, um, at doing that over time, and it won't work if it's not really managed. Um, but I, it does seem like an opportunity. We are, you know, just as a community, learning how to share parking space and make better space of the land that we do dedicate to cars. And um, it seems like this is a good opportunity for that. I guess my list. Right. So I've got two more things to say. Um, I keep going back to that street improvements, and I just think it'd be so great to do the street first and make it a really nice kind of Pacific Garden Mall level streetscape. I know that kind of doesn't work funding wise, but just seeing that, I was like, yeah, let's invest in that street. Because in the last 15 years, it has gotten way better, the streetscape. You remember, it used to just be kind of like very scungy, and there's some trees here. So I wanted to point that out. I have this broader planning concern about just industrial zones and kind of adjacencies. I was out at T-ball practice the other day and like smelled the spray paint coming from one of those factories over there. And that's great, that's where factories should be. But where I was always taught, never give away your industrial, keep it in case that lead factory moves in later on or whatever it is. So how do we, I know you're doing it already, but how do we keep carefully managing, well, I want zero lot line and a concrete factory next door. Like, how do we work through that with these parcels? Yeah, that's a that's a really great comment. And that is definitely something that um, Granite Rock brought up. You know, they have concerns whether or not they're on the project map. They have concerns about the land use next door changing from a currently, like, industrial land use. They have dust. They have trucks. They Trucks make noise. They do repairs there. Things are stinky. Um, and I think, you know, all of those are things that we're going to have to address as we get into the entitlements phase of any new development project. We're going to have to think about, like, how can we orient this building and, you know, maybe windows on that side aren't openable. And so, like, the interior of the building has to be planned a little bit differently so that we can acknowledge that there is an industrial neighbor on that side and that the residents need to be kind of shielded from that. And the industrial uses have a right to continue and operate. Right? We want to make sure that there um, aren't mutually conflicts that are created because of the new development. Parking is obviously one of those, but um, you, know, you bring up a really good point about other sorts of offsite impacts of industrial land. Um, you know, that is something that we are always thinking about, and one of, the, one of the big challenges with finding any location in the city for a navigation center is like, 
what's the trade-off that we're going to choose, right? Are we going to choose to put this, you know, a facility like this in um, some place that's far from existing services, closer to other residential uses, in the core of our commercial downtown that has lots of other demands on that space, um, or are we going to look to sort of consolidate? And at the at the moment, that's sort of the direction that we're taking is to consolidate and that that does mean the uh, conversion of some amount of industrial land which um, you're correct we are usually very um, protective of industrial land for exactly that reason these are job generators these are you know uses that we don't really want migrating to other neighborhoods um, and this is just kind of how we're striking that balance, this is the choice that the city's making right now. And is it perfect? At No, nothing in land use is perfect. So um, yeah, I think we're gonna have to continue to monitor that and um, do everything that we can to ensure that it's, um, if not, if it can't be a beneficial relationship, that it's at least not antagonistic. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, I mean, no, it's a challenge. Remember that a lot of that comes in the planning way down the road what kind of filtration your building has, how soundproof those walls are. I'm good. So I think that's all I've got. I'm just reflecting on all the other, like this is my 10th year on the Planning Commission, can you believe that? And all the weird uses we've talked about over those 10 years up here, like the weightlifting, you know, gym one, I had to get a special use permit because mm -hmm. you can't technically do gym and, in that area and oh the marijuana dispensaries mm -hmm. there's a lot in that neighborhood kind of for the same reason that no neighbors really want that right next to their house so um that's interesting and so i just feel weird about like sticking our homeless people there but that's the only place it can go really that could work that i can think of so great let's do it there better to do it there than not at all All right, that's what I've got. Any other comments? I will adjourn the meeting. Thanks, staff. That was interesting. Uh, Lee, do you have any other? Sorry, before we adjourn, do you have any announcements? Uh, subcommittee? No announcements. Special that? meeting, and so um, nothing else on the agenda other than the item we just discussed. Great. Thanks. We'll see you soon. Thank you.